moments here and uh, set the framework for this sermon. Many of you remember uh, that we are in a summer-long series on revolutionary living. And that this series is grounded in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is, uh, you know, this, this continuous historical presentation of the early church written and packaged and uh, 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 put together by uh, the same person who wrote the gospel according to Luke. And uh, many folks tend to believe that this uh, gospel according to Luke was written uh, with the eyewitness testimony of Peter and Paul. Alright, so many folks believe Acts to be Luke part 2. And uh, you said it probably 10 times now, so you know, maybe next week I'll call one of you up here to give this general introduction, alright? And we do it every week because I want to, you know, acknowledge that some folks may be here for the first time and may not know a whole lot about the book of Acts. Uh, it is, again, um, the, the, the very, like, concrete uh, narrative of how the early church responded to the words of Jesus. They took what they heard and they went out into a very agnostic context and began to allow the word of God and the testimonies and the things that they saw and heard just be unleashed. And uh, in many ways, it started a revolution, a revolution of, of, of the Jesus uh, ways, which uh, I think have many ways continue to this day. So since we are thinking and talking about revolutionary living, uh, we thought it'd be great to start with the original Jesus Revolution started and see how then can we uh, tap into that same power and energy in the name of the Lord. So uh, we're here in uh, the book of uh, Acts chapter number 10. Now this is a very long chapter and we don't have all day to read all of these <laughs> verses. Um, so we'll jump around, praise God, amen? Because I, I, I think uh, the, 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 the chapter is, is good for us to learn this story. So I invite you this week while you are engaging in your own Bible study and prayer time every day. Somebody say every day. Every day. Amen. You got 48 verses divided by six. Amen. Because I know you ain't doing it on Sunday. Praise God. So it's six divided by 48. That's about what? Eight verses a day. Praise God. So you can read eight verses every day and get through this chapter. Somebody say amen. amen. And then I ain't got to read all 48 today. Unless you just want me to. Verse number one. Chapter number 10. It reads along these lines, in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius who was a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. And again, the centurion, just for your information, was uh, one of these uh, occupying armies. So the Romans, uh, whenever they went into a different part of the world, they uh, took over the country, they left the country and the nation keep their religion and keep their cultural practices as long as they pay taxes. And they left the centurions there to make sure there was no uprising, all right? So they were like an occupying army, if you will, an occupying force, and uh, these centurions were not considered the, the, the allies of the people. But here in this story, Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, he was a devout man who feared God with all of his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon about three o'clock he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And you know, I can't help but wonder if this is, you know, uh, uh, sanitized, you know. You know, I don't know if you saw an angel or some ghost just pop up in your room. Would you be calling on the Lord? Would you have a few other colorful metaphors and then describe your, your terror? Praise God. But he says, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When an angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves, a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. So, 
So again, it has this centurion named Cornelius has this vision, an angel, you know, in this room, tell him go find Peter. Verse number nine. And about noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. And he became hungry, wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. Now this is grounded again in the Jewish practices of their dietary laws. Many of us have heard or may know some folk uh, who uh, subscribe to the kosher. I don't know if you kosher uh, dietary laws where you won't eat certain kinds of food for four-footed, uh, you know, uh, beats with hooks and won't eat certain kinds of like, you know, things. I don't know if you ever had like fried alligator or anything like that. It's kind of down south. It was pretty good. It actually tastes like chicken, but uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't eat none of that kind of stuff, all right? So, so, so Peter, as a good Jew, he sees all this stuff and being told to eat it, and Peter's like, I can't eat that. I'm Jewish. But the voice of the Lord told Peter, get up, kill, and eat it. Verse number 15, the voice said to him a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. Yes. And this happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had, been, that he had seen. The seven the men sent by Cornelius appeared, and as you continue to read, they all fell down and worshiped Peter. And Peter tells them, and uh, let's see, verse number 26, Get up, stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked to them on verse 27 right now, he went in and found that many of the folks in Cornelius' house were assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves, this is Peter's telling them, You know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anything profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? Then Bernice goes through and shows him his vision about all of these, you know, the angel that showed up in his room and asked him to come. And, and, and verse number 34, Peter begins to speak to them and says, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him, to God. And Peter begins to preach the message of the gospel of Jesus to the centurion and his family. And verse number 44 wraps it up. It says, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. And the circumcised believers, those church folk that was with Peter, they were all surprised and astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they invited him to stay for several days. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So a, a very wonderful description and passage of the, the ways in which God challenges Peter and Cornelius around their own assumptions, and it creates the topic for today's sermon uh, in our ongoing series about revolutionary living, facing our own deeds. Facing our own demons. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God. That is bereft for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. That rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, I have some demons to face. Tell them that I have some demons. <laughs> All right, one of the greatest challenges uh, that I believe that many of us will ever face is overcoming those places in our lives that have caused us pain, hardship, or difficulty. Particularly, how those moments have shaped the
the way in which we see the world. Because for many of us, we are rarely forced to deal with these difficult places and spaces in our lives constructed. Many of us, uh, as Sigma Freud says, suppress a whole lot of stuff and repress a whole lot of stuff. And, you know, Freud's observation over many years of counseling folk is that uh, that which you suppress or repress in your psyche will eventually come back to the surface. That uh, no matter how big and bad we think we are, how powerful we are, uh, that uh, you can't hold that stuff down indefinitely. Uh, one of the biblical principles of scripture say that all that stuff that you put in the dark, that's done in the dark, will eventually what? Come to the light. So we got, you know, Freud and, and, and God, you know, they kind of on the same page, pretty well. Uh, but, but what's so fascinating about this whole idea of that which is repressed coming to light is that if we'll be honest, praise God, while we're here at church, uh, that usually when things come to light, they come without your permission. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. You know, we cover real good, you know, you know, until that trigger gets hit. Or your song come back. Or that, that aroma, you know. And then everything starts rushing back. And you, oh, I thought I had that covered. You know, I, I had that under control. Cain, if you don't do well, 
Sin is lying at the door of your heart. And it's lurking. It wants to have you. It wants to pounce on you. But you must master it. You must overcome it. This notion that there are things inside all of us that are lurking. That are waiting to pounce at a moment's notice. Is something I want you to hold in your mind as an image as we move throughout this sermon. Because one of the truths of life that I want to humbly submit to you is that you cannot overcome that which you continue to deny. That overcoming only starts when you start acknowledging that you got some problems. You can't overcome that when you try to act as a new. How, how did that work? How do you overcome something that you're not willing to work on? Right? Uh, and one of the gifts of the gospel is that the role of the Spirit through salvation will lead and guide us into truth. It will start to unmask the deceptions that we often build as a form of compensation for all the trauma and junk and mess that has happened in our life. And how many of you know that if you can be honest with yourself, you need the Lord, who is that good shepherd, to lead That you can't go through that stuff by yourself and think that you're going to miss all these lurking things that are ready to pounce on you. Uh, that in many ways, uh, God wants you and I to come face to face with those places in our lives that we would rather ignore or forget. Those things that we like, uh, you know, if I just work hard enough, make enough money, Bad enough women, uh, you know, drink enough, smoke enough, party enough, build a big house. If I can just get all these things, then all that stuff that I'm repressing will not creep back up. But remember, it's coming when you least expect it. And if we don't learn how to deal with our challenges, then they will cause you and I to miss out on blessings and opportunities to do the work and the will of God. Our willingness to embrace the truth of Jesus is at its core about our ability to face the truth about ourselves. Because uh, you know, the truth about yourself is that you're not all good. <laughs> and the truth about yourself is that you're not all bad. Right. So it don't help you to be soaking over here, oh, woe is me, I'm just such a horrible person. You know, I, 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 just, I just can't never do anything right. How I many that's not going to help you get to where you need to be? Right. And then it's not going to be sitting over here like, oh, I'm just a bomb. I mean, I don't want to tell that earlier. That, I told you to tell your neighbor, they're the bomb, right? Yes. Okay, not you, not you, bomb. <laughs> but you're not going to be sitting around here just like thinking that your stuff don't stink, right? That you just got it all together, that you just, you know, without any error or, or, or difficulty, because that don't help you get to where you need to be either. That part of what it means to embrace the truth about yourself is you got to take the good With the bad. and the bad. And I'll leave the rest alone. <laughs> Tell so your neighbor, I need to face some things. I need to face some things. And that's what really this sermon is about. So here we have in this story Cornelius and Peter. These are two men who have a particular relationship and encounter with God. Cornelius was not a Jew, meaning that he was not born in the cultural or lineage of the Israelite nation. But he did subscribe to Jewish religious practices. That to be uh, a Jew, to be a, a, a Israelite man, that you worship one God. His name was Yahweh. He was the only God and you worship him. And that doesn't 
alienated uh, the Jewish nation from all of their other nation, national uh, neighbors that because many of them uh, worship many gods. So the Jewish folk were known to be monotheistic, worshiping of one God, and everyone else pretty much were polytheistic, which meant they worshiped many gods. Are you following? Following? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so there were some people in other nations who subscribed to the Jewish notion of worship of one God, and they were called God fearers. So you had folk who were not necessarily Jewish, but they worshiped Yahweh, they worshiped the one God, and they were called God fearers, and that was Cornelius Storm. He was one person who actually participated in the Jewish religious practices of giving alms and of, of offering prayers and doing all of these pieces, but it raises, I think, a wonderful point for all of us to appreciate, and that is one can be a worshiper of God and do good works without activating or accepting the salvific work of Christ in your life. You can be a good person and still not have yet had a Christ event. You can do good, engage in spiritual practices of prayer, give charity, money to the poor, and still be in need of a transformational experience with Jesus. And what's at stake there is this whole idea that our salvation does not come by what we do. Because there's nothing you can do to pay God back for all of the sacrifice that was made for our soul salvation on the cross. Later today, we will celebrate this, this, this salvation and this sacrifice when we take communion, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we are reminded that our salvation was not because of us. There are a lot of folks who make you think that you just do good and, you know, do enough good things and your good outweighs your bad. Like, I hope I die on the right day, right? Because, you know, I could. <laughs> Amen. That's, that's how, and you just kind of landed on the wing of the prayer. <laughs> but when you are in a relationship with Jesus, all of your righteousness is like filthy rags. And guess what? Your salvation is still secure. Ooh, I just sent a chill up my spine. Praise God. That, that means that I don't have to walk around here trying to figure out if my good outweighs my bad. All I, got to, all I need to do is make sure that my relationship with Jesus is secure. Like, how's that going to convince somebody? 
You should follow. And you'd be like, Peter, I mean, you was with Jesus. Surely you would have worked that thing out. But this points to this truth that your, 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 your spiritual formation is a lifelong process. Yes. And, and part of these practices are intended to help work out stuff in you that you would otherwise be unworked. And Peter is one of these kind of folk who has in many ways understood through this encounter, another encounter, another Christ event, that, that there's some things in his own life that he had to get dealt with. And I just want to lift this up to us today as we get a little bit more into the meat of this sermon, that you got some stuff that God is saying, I need to help you face today. Because it made no good for you to come to church every week and leave with the same kind of junk you walked in with. Hallelujah. It don't make no sense for you to come to church every week and singing all these songs and praying all these prayers and the same folk you hated before you came and the same folks you hate when you leave. You have not learned the art of forgiveness. You have not learned how to deal with your own trauma and your own stuff. So you then enact that on other people. Tell your neighbor, I got some demons to face today. And it's okay because you're not facing them by yourself. self-deception, but if you come into the way, you come in to face the truth about yourself. Ain't it Brother Michael Jackson? I love you. He said, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. Yeah. I'm not just looking at the man. What else am I doing? Asking him to change his ways. ways. Yes. Amen. Some of y'all can learn something from Brother Michael Jackson. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know too much about that Bible. Michael Jackson. I like the way he said, give your neighbor a high five and tell him, change your ways, change your ways, change your ways. All right, so here we go. Uh, let's look at a couple of things that I think the scripture first gives to us. Uh, the first thing that the text tells us in this story is that bias and preference can often be unconscious to us, but it still must be addressed. Somebody help address my bias. Say it loud, address my bias. Peter steeped in a cultural identity and set of experiences and narratives is presupposing, listen, who and what God can do with Cornelius. So this vision that Peter is having is in many ways a, 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 a innocent kind of, it comes from an innocent place that in order for the children of Israel to truly follow the ways of God, God gave they had to do, some of it was grounded in their diet. And the early uh, laws around their diet were in many ways a way to keep them healthy and well. So it didn't come from a place of pernicious like uh, 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 a meaning or intent. It, it was just this notion that in order for you to truly be well and be my followers, I need you to take good care of yourself so don't eat these certain kind of foods. But when those laws became elevated to a place of exclusion. God says, wait a minute now. I, I, I didn't mean for you to assume that I can't work in people's lives just because they don't have the same kind of rules going on that I gave you. This is a little tricky thing for some of us because we think, you know, all the rules apply to me when it's comfortable. But when it's Uncomfortable, it's like, oh God, your grace is sufficient. <laughs> your grace is sufficient for me. Because in my weakness, you know, we, we got to work. Ooh, in my weakness, God is made strong. Yes, God know. <laughs> but when you deal with folk you don't know, or when they got a struggle you don't have, you're like, I can't believe them people continuing to struggle with drinking. Man, they just need to get saved. <laughs> You over here, me, you know, just roly poly, praise God. <laughs> I've been trying not to eat so much. I've been trying to go work out, but I told you last week that spirit is willing. <laughs> Ooh, the flesh is a bear. <laughs> that, that in many ways, that, that there, there are some certain assumptions we have about each other and the world in which we live that are often covered or, or informed. Are grounded, they start in an innocent place, but when they begin to get elevated, 
universalize. And universalize these assumptions are what cause us to fall into sinful and demonic traps. And let's be clear that this plays itself out in very interesting ways because we then begin to assign value and worth to folk who have a different view or, or take on the world than we do. And now I know it's easy for us to like, you know, start talking about this like, you know, between the races, right? Between this made up category. I just want to let you know, race is a made-up category. Just like your height is a made-up category. What if it's something we discriminate against people based on your height? You know, it's like, you can't come into this restaurant because you're too tall. Like, what? That's ridiculous. Well, that's how ridiculous it is when folks did it with race. Amen. So it's easy to go across race, but I have found that some of the worst kinds of attitudes and perceptions are not between the races, but intra-racial. According to the sciences, uh, when you mention poor folk, formerly incarcerated, uh, 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 immigrants, and African Americans, that your brain can light up in all other kind of places, but when you start to de deal with these categories, your brain just stays shut down. How we all have been, in many ways, arrested by these demonic assumptions, and we think that, oh, that's just people doing Here goes the neighborhood. <laughs> Some of you doing everything you can not to live in certain zip codes. Hello, somebody. I wish I had a church in here. <laughs> That ain't discipleship, folks. That's not spiritual formation. 
by the testimony. So you can say, I used to have this, but God. Ah. And I don't know about you, there ain't never more powerful than a but God. I mean, whatever you want through, just put but God at the end of it and see how it turned out. Oh, uh, I had this addiction, but God. I had my problems in this marriage, but God. Oh, uh, I was down and out, but God. I tried to kill myself, but I'm telling you, but God, that thing will work. Some of you really trust that person out on Facebook you don't even do, but, but God. And if it wasn't for God, you'd be in a world of hurt. <laughs> the second thing we see in this text is that Peter and Cornelius have to be open to a new story. A new vision, a new narrative of the world. So not only do you need to face your demons, but you then have to be open to the new. Somebody say open to the new. Open to the new. Facing the demons is only the first step because how many of you know if you don't that I've been using as a proxy, but I want you to imagine all of the other ways in your life where you are being constricted by the old. This gospel principle applies everywhere. There are historical experiences and descriptions that have been used to limit and describe you. Think of all the folks out there who try to diminish your humanity, try to put you in a box related to your call that God has in your life. Trying to tell you how the salvation don't work for you because you're just too bad. Trying to tell you that you can't reach and achieve the impossible. Bring to your mind all the abuse, whether verbal, physical, emotional, or even sexual, that has locked you into the pattern and cycle of limitation and isolation. And I hear the scriptures telling you and I today that God wants us to be open to the new. Not limited by the old. around what is possible when we are open to the new. Can you imagine what our world would look like if we didn't know each other by our failures, our struggles, or our pains? If we begin to see in each other the dignity and the spark of the divine. Origin, he was a North African church father from the third century, and he says that we are created in the image of God, and all of us carry within us the spark of the divine. It, it is this idea that, that God has put his unique thumbprint on your life. That people will try and make you feel like that you're a piece of dirt and you don't make so many mistakes or you don't miss this opportunity and that opportunity. You got this character deficiency or that. But God will say, no, my thumbprint is an example and an indication that no matter what you do, there's still something valuable about what I created you to be. Do I have anybody that depends on God's thumbprint in your life? When people try to tell you what you can't do, you're reminded what God said you can do. Oh, I feel something pushing me. Uh, uh, wouldn't it be something if you and I actually spent the rest of our lives trying to uh, not live out these old narratives? 
from you just like he did Peter. And he'll ask you a question. Didn't I call that clean? Didn't I say that was okay? So who are you to say that I can't do what I already know? Then it's something God talked to Peter after he talked to Cornelius. Come on. So it wasn't like God was asking Peter permission. God was just inviting Peter to get in on what God was already doing. I'm here to tell you some of us need to step into this new story of God. This new way of living. This new way of 